I would like to announce our next speaker, the really great scientist, uh, Raul uh, <laughs> Dinov, and uh, uh, his talk is um, genetically induced tonic dopamine release from VTA nucleus accumbens projections inhibits rewards consumatory behavior. You are very welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, while we are copying my files here on the computer, I would like to thank uh, organizers for this uh, great uh, attempt to bring all Russian speaking up to genetic researchers together. And uh, I think uh, looking on a hall full of young people, uh, the mission is accomplished uh, and uh, really created great interest in this topic, this great approach. And uh, I hope it in a couple of minutes will be copied and I can start showing you some data. Uh, uh, another thing, uh, what I would like to present here, it's not like development of new techniques or something, it's just practical application of already well-established approaches in optogenetics uh, mm -hmm. to answer some uh, mm -hmm. very concrete questions, uh, something really mm, practical, necessary, understandable and uh, yes uh, so that's what would be my talk okay uh, so today I would like to present uh, some uh, our observations on optogenetically induced tonic dopamine on the role of optogenetically induced tonic dopamine release uh, on reward related behaviors. So, and uh, first of all, I would like to say here that uh, this work was mostly done by Evgeny uh, Budigin, who is a professor in our Institute of Translational Biomedicine in, in St. Petersburg State University, but also prof associate professor at Wake Forest University in USA. And uh, another person who is uh, mostly involved is Maria Mikhailova, my PhD student. Uh, which we, uh, actually learned this technique in the uh, Evgeny's lab uh, in the US. And unfortunately, Evgeny was not able to arrive here, and Maria right now is in the US too, so I had to be the least important person of these three, have to present this talk. So the work really was done by Maria and Evgeny. Uh, but we're collaborating uh, for many years with Evgeny, and these topics are kind of our joint topic of interest. Uh, the major reward-related system is the mesolimbic dopamine system. It's kind of a well-established fact today, and um, hundreds and hundreds of papers show that reward-related cognition, reward learning, seeking, and drug intake, positive reinforcement, uh, all relate to this brain area uh, called a mesolimbic dopaminergic system. Oop. Just a second. Uh, which originates from VTA, ventral tegmental area, and projects to mm, ventral striatum area called nucleus accumbens. So this mm, pretty much, uh, it's also projects to frontal cortex, but pretty much that's uh, most of the research of addiction and normal and abnormal reward related processes are focused on. And the molecule of interest is dopamine. Uh, addictions can include, but not limited uh, to drug abuse, alcohol, nicotine, food addiction, and even gambling and computer addiction. And uh, nucleus accumbens, as I said, is a major brain area, and um, VTA is a key, uh, and nucleus accumbens is a key to study these processes. Uh, dopamine as a neurotransmitter, it's a uh, quite interesting. Uh, uh, like for last 20 years, uh, people have noted that uh, dopamine can be released naturally with two main parameters, phasic and tonic. Phasic, as you can see here, is a burst firing, like with a frequency 50 hertz, like a large increase of dopamine, usually above 50 nanomole. Uh, and while tonic is a long term, but uh, 5 hertz uh, stimulation, and usually this is 10, 15, 20 nanomole uh, dopamine, which is getting uh, outside of the synapse. Uh, outside of cell. And uh, starting from this paper in 2009, it was shown that a uh, predominant component uh, of uh, dopaminergic uh, signaling is a uh, phasic firing, 
which is involved in many behavioral conditioning related uh, processes, including uh, cocaine self-administration and so on and so on. So here you can see uh, by voltammetry, I'll stop on that a little bit later, that's a phasic dopamine release and tonic stimulation is very low here, but you can see it. Uh, phasic dopamine release uh, uh, functions is, um, uh, usually it's related to presentation of cues. So this is a key for conditioning related processes, at least as regard to dopaminergic system. Uh, phasic dopamine release um, uh, uh, encodes the full range of reward prediction error necessary for reinforcement learning. And phasing, uh, but not tonic dopamine release, as I said, it was done by optogenetics, also by several labs, uh, is solely responsible for the development of conditional place preference to different types of drugs. Uh, tonic is, uh, while the function of uh, phasic dopamine is quite well investigated, uh, the tonic dopamine release function is still under question. There are some papers, but not too much right now. And the aim was um, to, uh, the first part of my talk, was to study whether driving mesolimbic dopamine transmission into tonic mode affects natural reward system uh, consumption in the same fashion. So um, experimental procedure is quite uh, simple, viral uh, constructs and packaging, stereotaxis virus injection, sucrose drinking behavior was used as a natural reward uh, consumption, uh, and then you do gistochemistry confirm expression and fast can cyclic voltammetry, I will stop on that point later, and optical stimulation during sucrose drinking. So, Rats were used as the most convenient for this type of experiments, uh, animal species. Uh, and uh, fast scan cyclic voltammetry. I would like to stop a little bit more here and to uh, describe a little bit more. All the rest was excellently described by Alexei, and uh, I will skip some time on that, so save some time on uh, other parts of this experimental protocol. But voltammetry is a uh, um, based on implantation or um, application of a um, carbon fiber electrode. You see this in comparison to hair, human hair, the size of this carbon fiber electrode, uh, which uh, allows detection of dopamine based on a fast scan of a voltammogram. And uh, here on the tip of this, uh, you see about 100 micrometers and diameter 7 micrometers. On the tip of this electrode, dopamine is oxidized and you can detect it. Uh, so, um, and usually uh, you put some stimulating electrode or optogenetic uh, fiber in a substantia nigra and detect it in uh, nucleus accumbens. But you can do it a different way, but that just a commonly used protocol. So, as I told you, that uh, dopamine is, uh, um, undergoes reaction of oxidation uh, and reduction, and uh, from dopamine appears dopamine uh, or quinone, and there is uh, electrical detection of this process. And by running the full voltammogram, you can get very specific pattern of uh, oxidation. So you can differentiate dopamine from other uh, electroactive substances. For example, for norepinephrine, it will be different one, uh, here you can see that's the signal, what you detect, and you immediately identify, it's called fingerprinting, uh, of specific pattern of oxidation and reduction. And for serotonin it will be different, for the, the deoxyphenyl acetic acid it will be different, for norepinephrine different, so every neurotransmitter uh, pretty much uh, has different patterns, that's why you can pretty much sure that this signal is really dopamine or something else. Uh, here I think the part what I can really skip because this, uh, in this conference you've heard a lot about optogenetics, how it's working, why it is important to have in this very complex system like human brain, to uh, not or animal brain, why it's important to have opportunity to selectively activate or inhibit certain population of neurons and how it can help us to address millions of questions. So I'm just skipping the slides, you know it very well now I guess. And uh, two gentlemen, Carl Diseros and Ed Boyden, uh, who actually introduced, uh, brought it to uh, practice, to everyday practice of uh, hundreds of thousands and thousands of labs. That's the two uh, major uh, colleagues uh, which are actually quite, um, we have met with Jenny them when they were not famous, I would say this way, <laughs> when they just started this thing. Uh, and um, uh, they really, 
as you know, not not created this technique. Uh, These um, basic uh, things were already described while before. What they really achieved, they put it in uh, everyday practice. That's a, that's a major. T uh, they really pushed it uh, and give new tools, uh, develop new tools, uh, and give people like me uh, opportunity to to address questions which are of my interest. And uh, that's approximately, uh, if you uh, just to remind you that in 1979, Francis Crick anticipated that uh, there will be some approach uh, to activate selectively only certain populations of cells. So it's a lot of people were thinking before about that. But um, Carl Disseros and Boyden really moved it thing seriously. And that's one of the first papers, what they pub not the first, but probably one of them, when they really showed that you can do it in vivo. So you can really manipulate with certain population of cells and uh, see change behavior or something. Again, you know this thing, I'm skipping. Okay, so um, basically, as uh, Alexei already pointed out, you can uh, now there's um, several um, versions of transgenic mice exist and you can just use this mice and try to, which is already uh, expressing some uh, options and uh, you can use them. But uh, still, uh, most studies are being done with viruses. And uh, channel rhodopsin can be expressed in specific cells through use of cell-specific promoter. And um, the problem is, usually you have limited packaging capability to put in the same place, and rhodopsin, and uh, GFP, for example, YFP, and some promoter. And uh, there are several approaches now uh, being developed how to uh, to to uh, to to get through these problems, and I will stop on that a little bit later. Uh, so again, you know all these things it was described many times. I would uh, skip it. Uh, so we really used here. Uh, we uh, ha have engaged in the same problem like many others with a uh, AAV. We were not able to put t uh, not only us. Um, most dopamine researchers wanted to express something only in dopamine neurons. And the best available promoter is tyrosine hydroxylase, rate-limiting step uh, enzyme uh, in the synthesis of dopamine. And, uh, but the problem was you nobody was able to put it in one virus. And uh, that's why the selective expression of something on dopamine neurons was uh, quite questionable. Uh, until in 2005, our great friend uh, Caroline Bass from Buff University of Buffalo, she suggested to do it a uh, combinatorial approach. So she has one virus, which exp uh, has a uh, carrying promoter, TH promoter, and second virus, uh, which is uh, carrying uh, channel rhodopsin. Uh, and uh, uh, through Crelox system, she in injects, uh, she suggested to inject two viruses, and uh, through Crelox system, expression of uh, channel rhodopsin occurs only in TH uh, containing neurons, so it's pretty much dopamine in the VTA. Uh, so that's how it's done, and it's, uh, this approach was uh, surprisingly effective. Uh, the, the really uh, many papers now that's all details already published. You can get it in this paper, Gomp et al., so you can see it there. Uh, so uh, again, Alexei already described, so we injected uh, this cocktail of two viruses, uh, then uh, implanted uh, uh, optic uh, cannulas, and y you see uh, expression here, confirmation of channel reduction to expression on dopaminergic neurons. That's TH on the left, tyrosine hydroxylase. That's channel rhodopsin, and this overlap. So it's very nicely, uh, very selectively, which is actually very important. You don't want to get involved with other types of neurons here. You want to work only with uh, your dopaminergic neurons. So, um, again, so uh, as I told you, we uh, inject in the VTA, that's brain area. Oh, i show you here, VTA. What? and detected in nucleus accumbens. That's pretty much our basic protocol. N not, uh, not exclusive, but basic. And you, you, you see it's in VTA expression of, of uh, again, uh, channel rhodopsin, TH, G, uh, here's GFP. GFP, and uh, applied light, as usually in here. I hope video will work. I uh, would like to show you this video of real experiment. In this case, it's anesthetized animal, but we... Uh, you see, the light was coming and uh, immediately dopamine, uh, dopamine measurement by uh, fast cancer cyclic voltammetry. 
So uh, if you missed it, I, uh, uh, the light was coming, blue light here, and you got uh, here this nice increase in Viva, showing that you really can uh, achieve a, uh, dopamine release through optogenetic stimulation. Uh, what is important here, optogenetics allow you to use different uh, patterns of dopamine release. You can use one pulse, which is pretty much undetectable if you do electrical stimulation. Uh, in all the, for the last 20 years, people were using voltammetry with electrical stimulation, but you non-selectively activate a lot of neurons and there are a lot of other problems, which I will describe later. Here you can get very nice 60 pulses phasic release or some even below tonic, one pulse, 20 pulses, uh, different um, uh, variants. Then another thing, you c uh, it's very selective seems to be here. If you look, uh, uh, you put electrode uh, lower, lower, and the nucleus accumbens is just this lowest part of the striatal region, as I mentioned, it's called striatal gerina, this VTA. So you d here you detect nothing, nothing, nothing. And only in nucleus accumbens you got nice signal. So it's really uh, expressed way it should be. The same thing you can do now with striatum. If you do substantia nigra, which is next area to VTA, you can get now expression only in, uh, in uh, uh, dorsal striatum. So you can play both ways. Okay, here... Uh, it's already done. So um, we compared uh, just uh, how we can get now um, uh, release characteristics and uptake characteristics. The point is when you do voltammetry, you got release and very quick clearance through dopamine transporter. And you can measure activity of dopamine transporter from the same uh, piece of data. Uh, and uh, look like optical electrical stimulation gives you approximately the same characteristics of dopamine release in the uh, uptake. Uh, a little bit lower um, uh, on dopamine efflux, but that's uh, just a trend. Probably have some better se selective uh, effect on certain population of cells. Uh, you can play with pulse width here. So you can increase uh, time of exposure, uh, data frequency, uh, um, uh, train duration dependency pulse width. So, so you can play with different components here to try to mimic the, the desired pattern of uh, dopamine release. Um, another thing, uh, when you do electrical stimulation, you may get some called uh, pH changes, uh, mostly connected to alterations in blood flow and CO2 concentration uh, here electrically. But when you do uh, voltammetry, um, of course you can deduct it, there are some programs to play with this, uh, that's what you see kind of pH changes, but you can uh, certainly uh, eliminate it by certain ways, but here uh, with optogenetics we don't see that. We don't see that. The optogenetics is very clean, very nice uh, pattern of dopamine release. Uh, another thing, so usually when you do expression in the VTA and measuring dopamine in nucleus accumbens, uh, you, it requires two weeks. As Alexei said, for every virus there is a certain time of period. Uh, but in, uh, if you wait another two weeks, then you can actually stimulate and detect everything just in nucleus accumbens. So expression level of the uh, channel rhodopsin getting higher, and you now p can play right in the slices. In this case, you make brain slice, and you can put it and play together. And uh, what was interesting, uh, we noted uh, that uh, just light, if you put an uh, on electrode, can cause some photochemical reaction, which I, we don't know what, but can give you a signal. But you see fingerprint is completely different from uh, dopamine. Uh, but uh, that's why when you do these kind of experiments, it's better to have some distance between stimulating, uh, stimulating the light and uh, detecting electrode. Uh, but if you, that's what uh, another thing, if you move it a little bit apart, put it, uh, uh, then you can get very nice dopamine signal in the same case. So you have to be just careful. So what is a major advantage of the genetics? Because it allows to examine cause versus effect. So uh, we can see what particular pattern of dopamine release can cause or inhibit a certain behavior. It controls neurons within intact neuron uh, circuits, highly flexible. Millisecond time resolution, you can manipulate with time resolution. Especially uh, restrictive and then you can specifically target to certain population of neurons. Uh, another thing, uh, Zhenya Budigin right now in Western Salem developed wireless uh, optogenetic thing to do it be behavior in vivo. You can see it in comparison to this five cents. 
um, uh, what size it is, so it's implantable, and now through just remote control you can uh, activate or inhibit certain cells. Uh, so that's already in process, and uh, he's already, that's what Maria right now is trying to do, uh, trying to do with uh, play with wireless uh, system. Um, as I mentioned, you can induce different patterns of dopamine release, and uh, there is tonic and phasic, uh, phasic 50 hertz, high, large burst uh, the dopamine and tonic is usually uh, mimicked by 5 hertz, and that's how it looks on a plot. If you see here, uh, that's tonic dopamine release, uh, often uh, stimulated, and you can get how it looks here. Um, again, it's dopamine, and that's phasic. On color plot, you can see it here, so that's a difference. And you can uh, very nicely, very um, consistently uh, induce it with a light right now. And what about um, uh, natural transients? So the point is, when you do voltammetry during behavior, uh, you're going to behavioral experiments independence, uh, independent, uh, dependent, uh, dependent on different cues, you can sometimes notice spikes of dopamine release. And here is an example of phasic dopamine release uh, in some animal behaving in uh, some environment, special environment. I don't know what exactly. Of course, you can use electrical stimulation to induce a tonic as well, but look at that. That's an optical stimulation, very nice, very consistent, very stable. And that's electrical stimulation, quite variable and changing all the time. So, mm, I, <coughs> so now when we established uh, all these protocols, uh, we decided to test it during sucrose drinking. So sucrose, as you know, naturally pleasurable uh, uh, liquid, uh, which is usually animals prefer and learn very easily to discriminate from water. So you have two bottles and one uh, water, uh, here uh, sucrose uh, sh with sugar, and animal naturally prefer it very, very much, uh, many times more, uh, to have suc uh, sucrose. And here two experimental protocols we used uh, when you are again uh, stimulate with EA and detect the nucleus accumbens, or you just directly stimulate and detect everything in nucleus accumbens. That's the difference in the two bottle chase drinking. You see how much they prefer sucrose. And implantation of virus does not change it, nothing. But when you do tonic stimulation, and uh, some other labs already show that when you do phasic stimulation, you kind of potentiate this. Uh, and here we did tonic stimulation, and you see decrease in uh, sucrose intake. So uh, it, it is, uh, was very clear data, and here you can see it's also on the uh, effect of bouts of leaking, number of links, uh, concentration, uh, amount of sucrose consumed, and there is some change. Uh, that's all uh, being changed when, whether we are stimulating VTA or nucleus accumbens, in both cases. So um, basically, uh, from this kind of small piece of data, it's clear, and nobody done that before. Before, so with phasic dopamine, as I said, people study mostly phasic, and tonic is not a kind of uh, under uh, um, attention, big attention right now. And why suddenly uh, tonic uh, stimulation can uh, suppress uh, sucrose drinking, which can be potentiated by phasic? The working hypothesis here, and uh, there are several labs are working on that right now, that uh, most likely by uh, tonic uh, stimulation of dopamine release, you activate presynaptic outer receptors, and then you're shutting down phasic dopamine release, and that's how you pretty much uh, kind of calm down this, uh, you know, affect this behavior, so reward-related behavior. Uh, so you, uh, another application of the same approach in a logical development. Now we're talking about ethanol self-administration procedure. The same thing, but now instead of sucrose, animal trained uh, to consume alcohol. And they learn it quite well and they do it very nicely. Uh, they prefer it almost as some people in this country do. Just a second. And not only in this country. Uh, so you see, so after training for a couple of months, uh, so animal in first five, ten minutes, they just uh, go uh, binge like drinking. When they drink for like five, ten minutes without interruption and drink significantly more um, ethanol. And this is 20% ethanol without uh, any uh, sugar or anything. So just quite unpleasant liquid. 
but they like it and uh, drink it tremendously. So, so that's how it works. And then, if we do optogenetic stimulation with uh, five hertz tonic acting optogenetic stimulation, animal really not prefer so much alcohol anymore. So, uh, um, so you can see it's uh, the same peak time, the same peak time when animal deprived and uh, once every two days is uh, giving, allowed to go to these uh, two bottles and so uh, no, no, inter uh, no, no interest to alcohol. So, uh, so it's reduced. Uh, so, uh, if you ch compare uh, average number of leaks for ethanol, you see decrease after five hertz, but after fifty hertz, there is nothing. So, this really and that uh, correlates with the uh, amount of uh, consum uh, c uh, consumption of alcohol. So, that's some data showing is in different way. So, you can see here that uh, no activation; they consume alcohol quite significantly. 50 hertz, pretty much the same. No activation here, for example, no activation. And this is 5 hertz activation. It's suppressing quite nicely. So, the, the, um, so th that's uh, pretty much shows again, uh, the idea is the same involvement of the presynaptic ultra receptors. Interestingly, also, that uh, it happens only in if uh, stimulation occurs in the drinking cage. So animal uh, uh, all the time sits in home cage and just the day experiments are, is put on a drinking cage. So they clearly influence, uh, there is some influence of uh, conditioning. So some environmental cues associated with this uh, um, uh, abnormal drinking behavior uh, is affected by tonic dopamine release increase. Operant, mm, uh, another thing, okay, this is just consumption. But what about motivation to obtain alcohol? And here, uh, animal is supposed to work now. Uh, so it has to press 30 times a uh, lever to get uh, alcohol. So you see here how it's, uh, now animal is trained to do lever press. It's checking, is there alcohol or not? Okay. No. Again, it keep pressing, pressing, and it should press 30 times. Before, before getting access to alcohol. Oh, here is video, I think, stopped somewhere. Okay, but eventually, uh, in just a second. So, now it's good. getting it. So, uh, here is a one interesting addition to this protocol. So animals learn now to press 30 times to get ethanol. But on one day, you can deprive fully of ethanol. So this day zero here, where is no alcohol. And you see how much animals are pressuring, pressing now uh, levers uh, up to 150, 200 times. So just trying to get alcohol. And that is considered to be motivation, uh, a reflection of motivation to get alcohol. And you can really work now on this paradigm here. And uh, uh, here, if you apply now phasic, increasing phasic release, you have great potentiation. If you apply toning, you get suppression of this alcohol-seeking behavior. So pretty much, it gives you idea that if you can find now some drug or manipula uh, manipulation which allow you either to uh, either to uh, affect uh, phasic dopamine release or tonic, uh, either you have to suppress to phasic or increase tonic. If you can find now a drug that can work this way, then it could be potentially a very nice uh, drug to reduce alcohol-seeking behavior which is uh, actually the key point in the treatment of alcoholism. And here it happened to be that we are working with one new type of uh, receptors called trace amine associated receptors, or TAR1, which have been more and more recognized as a potentially new 
uh, effective target uh, for treatment of a number of disorders. Uh, uh, but uh, what I would say, uh, TAR1 uh, is detected in regions with a uh, dopaminergic system, caudate, nucleus accumbens, uh, VTA. Um, and um, trace amines are actually uh, very close to classical amines. It's beta phenylethylamine, uh, tyramine, octopamine. Uh, tryptamine, they're very close to classical monoamines and uh, just in 2001 a new group of receptors was found which bind them uh, and we, our lab here mostly in St. Petersburg is uh, uh, trying to understand the function of these receptors. There are six functional receptors in humans and we're trying to knock out and to, 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 to find ligands for all of them and going one after another and the best study is trace amine associated receptor 1 uh, actually, uh, is um, now on the third phase of clinical trials for uh, schizophrenia, antidepressant activity, they sh uh, mostly schizophrenia, but they also show antidepressant-like activity, improved cognition. Uh, and uh, Hoffman La Roche is pushing a lot of efforts now to get it into to the market. Uh, uh, and uh, one interesting thing, uh, TAR1 is potently modulate dopamine system. Pre presumably there are several mechanisms, but I would like to point you to this one. It makes heterodimers with D2-like receptors, and uh, presynaptically and postsynaptically. And this heterodimer of TAR1, D2, most, uh, is affecting uh, dopamine release. And uh, it was shown that TAR1 agonists can suppress dopamine release already, uh, but not uh, without figuring out what particular component, phasic or tonic. And um, um, uh, what is also interesting, there, uh, there is accumulating evidence that uh, TAR1 can be specifically interesting target for treatment of addiction. Uh, you're getting enhanced stimulatory effect of psychostimulants in uh, TAR1 knockout mice. Uh, enhanced sensitization to chronic amphetamine in knockout mice. Uh, enhanced rewarding properties of amphetamine. Uh, TAR1 agonist reduces methamphetamine self-administration and prevents reinstatement of cocaine self-administration. Uh, and it reduces cocaine and methamphetamine effect on dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens. And uh, there is some evidence that TAR1 actually knockouts have some altered effect to alcohol and TAR1 agonist uh, can uh, really suppress nicotine self-administration. Very nicely, very nice paper appeared just a couple of months ago. Uh, and uh, so now let's check how uh, what it does uh, now pattern of tonic or phasic dopamine release. And you see this is partial agonist, one of the best studied partial agonists of TAR1, and it suppresses exclusively phasic dopamine release. Uh, so it's exactly what we wanted to get, that the compound uh, does not affect tonic but only phasic dopamine release. And uh, uh, this effect is gone in TAR1 knockout mice. So you can see by voltammetry, it's completely absent in TAR1 knockout mice, proving. Uh, and so what it does now, alcohol-seeking behavior. We in injected different doses of uh, RO526-3397. This is partial TAR1 agonist. And you can see it's dose dependently suppressed cocaine behavior, alcohol-seeking behavior, without changing number of licks, so it's still able to consume, but it's uh, reducing motivation. So potentially, uh, again, this is in line with uh, all previous studies uh, supporting the use of TAR1 as an anti-addictive drug and uh, particularly for alcohol abuse could be a very interesting compound. And I should say that we are in St. Petersburg State University have now a program of developing our own TAR1 agonist and we already filed for first patent with our own agonist which is comparable by effectivity, by uh, effectiveness uh, as with these Roche compounds. Uh, hoping to catch them one day, probably will succeed. Uh, so that's a major conclusion that by alteration of tonic and phasic dopamine release, you can really change reward-related behaviors, and there is an opportunity that R1 uh, agonists can, uh, working through this mechanism, discovered, by the way, by uh, s through the use of optogenetic techniques, uh, can really uh, help to reduce motivation to obtain uh, alcohol. And I would like to thank uh, several people who were involved, but uh, mostly, again, Evgeny Budigin, Masha Mikhailova, but also some other people uh, who did a lot of, particularly Caroline Bass. Uh, Caroline Bass is from Buffalo. 
uh, sh who developed this very nice, very interesting uh, viral approach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for really exciting results. And, uh, now we have time for questions. Uh, before questions come, just very short technique. Thank you very much for development of very good approach to improve the population, Russian population, not to drink. <laughs> to give up, to, just for, <laughs> to make a stimulation, <laughs> very good. Okay. Yeah. I will ask question later. Uh, we just need <laughs> yeah, to, to activate our receptors. So, questions? Oh, Professor Balaban. So, very interesting results, and I'm a little bit confused because mm -hmm. um, um, in the long run, people think about release and quantity. Mm -hmm. If you have tonic release, but the quantity is the same, it is thought to be like physic but big in a sh another time. So, behavioral effects should be the same. Well, maybe the same. Maybe the mm -hmm. same. Um, I know exactly that for synaptic plasticity, tonic or phasic are different. Mm -hmm. So what may be the underlying mechanism, maybe your thoughts or mm -hmm. whatever? Uh, here, uh, amount could be the same, but the concentration is different. Okay, you're achieving. And the dopamine receptors, we have D, D1, D5, uh, five dopamine receptors. And uh, for example, to activate D1, you need one micromolar concentration. To activate D3, you need one nanomolar. So they are 1,000 times different by sensitivity. That's why you probably, probably, by different pattern, activate different receptors. And maybe causing different signals, signaling events. Actually, we plan to study that with the same technique. Now we can go uh, intra intracellular signaling events, and probably it will be different. That's our working hypothesis. As a, this is especially actually important for serotonin receptors. We have 15 of them, and they are all very different in sensitivity. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Hi, thank you for your lecture. Just a technical question. Why did you choose to do the unilateral activation of the genetically? Why not bilateral? I think usually people do it uh, in two hem hemispheres. Depending in uh, different approaches, here is just saving time and energy, you know. Why, yeah, you, right. yeah, why you expect uh, here something different in second <laughs> hemisphere? Yeah, what about the like uh, comp compensatory mechanisms on the other hemisphere? And did you ever try to, did you try it only like in the right hemisphere? Oh, it was done, a, uh, we, tried, we tried, and, uh, we tried. Actually, uh, <laughs> we just got paper published last year about when we tried to put in both sides and got actually activation on one and got activation on both sides uh, at the same time. When you unilaterally stimulate with okay. you got stimulation on both sides. It's a little bit complicated story. It just okay. Are you going to go into that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Raul, it's a great pleasure to see you again. Yeah, me too. And uh, so y your lecture was so optimistic. I think that now many people can enjoy drinking alcohol, <laughs> knowing <laughs> that uh, if there will be a problem, then they just uh, <laughs> take your drug. <laughs> yeah. But as I understand, you do not have at the moment uh, any drug against... Uh, uh, at the moment, at there the is moment. Uh, actually, you know, the problem is NIDA, National <laughs> Institute of Drug of Abuse, which so has a budget. Still, for we have to be careful. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, for a while. Uh, yeah, for a while, uh, for sure. But my question is uh, also there is a scientific part. Uh. So, what is known in neuroscience, for example, Parkinson disease, when they use these electrodes, they stimulate some parts of the brain, and then people can live some days without problem. So with optogenetics, is it possible to do, for example, you stimulate some parts of the brain with optogenetic yes. approach and uh -huh. then yeah. several days at least you do not yeah. like to drink a uh, <laughs> uh, I would like to first part of your question address first. Uh, you know, when uh, Eugenie published this uh, beginning of this story with ethanol, continuation is not published yet, uh, that you can, by tonic manipulation, can reduce the uh, 
drug, uh, alcohol seeking behavior, uh, uh, Russian uh, web news Gazeta Ru published commentary, and here I will move на русский перейду с вашего позволения. Название было мне очень понравилось. Алкоголикам засветит в мозг. Так что we prefer some different approaches through drugs still. Uh, but uh, regarding Parkinson's, uh, uh, it is uh, there are several labs are working because uh, there is a um, the, um, approach called deep brain stimulation. So you stimulate certain area, uh, areas of the subthalamic nuclei, uh, and you, nobody knows really what exactly happening there, which subtypes of cells are really responsible. There are several papers published in Nature right now trying to figure it out using optogenetics. But it's still uh, questionable. But uh, the idea is uh, you can now, by optogenetics, selectively stimulate the right population of neurons in subthalamic nuclei and to help them. It is an it is important topic of research. Indeed. Uh, we have a little bit more time for questions. So. Uh, have you tested uh, how your uh, method affects on social behavior? We not, but there are several papers right now in Nature. What Carl Disseroth did it. Uh, so we we personally not. We didn't get into that, but uh, some other people do that. So there's not an affection. Oh no no, it's huge effect on uh, social behavior. You can get it, but I don't recall just by. Uh, from the top of my head, I don't recall the data, but uh, it's Nature Science paper. It means it's a fact. Thank you. You can find it somewhere. Check. A question from Peter Brzezowski. Uh, okay. Uh, th th thank you very much. It was really very, very good, very interesting presentation. Uh, so first of all, about the comments, but you know, pro probably actually just to prefer Gardelis, actually, there was a DOPA-1, a DOPA-2 receptors, uh -huh. and, and those are also actually, they, they actually try to digest actually this with the stimulation, but on the animals, on the people it's not using. Mm -hmm. Deep brain stimulation for the, against Parkinson, they give actually just very nice um, uh, recovery, but for 30% of, of actually, actually of the people, and with some long lasting um, some time, after some time, actually, it's disappeared, unfortunately, in some cases. So there are many, some problems with that. Mm -hmm. My question is, actually, in the one last of slides, you show the, the, the receptors, postsynaptic and presynaptic, the same type receptors, yeah. just to do that. So yeah. it, is it known in this area or in some other areas, actually? And, and what, is the, what is the mechanism, actually, or the feedback, actually, which is, which is working on, on the presynaptic membrane? Uh -huh. No, but you know that the two type of receptors, they are both presynaptic and postsynaptic in general. But uh, they're identical. Uh, no, yeah, and TAR1 oh, is now, ah, yeah. Okay. Now, so now yeah. it's TAR1 is doing the same thing. Okay. It's like a modulator of the two dopamine receptors. So uh, quite significant number of papers right now show that. Uh, um, so that's why it interacts uh, presynaptically and postsynaptically, like a real start of the two dopamine receptor signal. Okay, probably. No, no, it, no. It, so if there is no question.